Okay, Meta Madness continues, everybody. Our first map in the best of three series, Tomb of the Garden Curse. So let's jump right in. We have Team Mena going up against Blikitni, and of course I'm going to go over some of the details of Meta Madness again. This is the second match of our group stage. We have Group A in front of us. We already had Team X-Ray and Team Hazu playing. Now we have Team Mena and Team Blikitni go against each other. Uh, the one thing that I have to say immediately is Team Mena is playing without Mena today, so unfortunately he had on short note some uh, real life stuff that he had to attend and he's going to be gone for the entire week he will be here for the main event on the other hand but his team is of course still present and they subbed in come on bear for him so in his absence banana age has taken over as the captain here but we have meta madness starting up and i gotta say immediately for all of you that are maybe not quite familiar with all of the rules of meta madness the way this tournament works is you have pre-banned Pre-banned heroes, which means 13 heroes are not available for these teams at all before we're even entering the series. That's Diablo, Diva, Medivh, Cassia, Brightwing, Abatha, Johanna is not available, Anan, Chromie can't be played, Imperius, Li Ming, Urel, and Tracer are all off topic. Can't pick them. Also, every single hero that gets pe uh, picked from here on out on any map is not available for the remaining uh, matches of the series. So if in game number one you see 10 heroes, they won't be allowed in game number two or potential game three. So with this, we're pretty much pushing the players a little bit out of their comfort zone. You still have heroes available that you can pick, you still can go for combos, but it's gonna be a little bit more iffy to really build a composition that makes a whole lot of sense and you might see some players on heroes that are not all that familiar with or not comfortable with playing. So uh, there's some fun games that come together at some point. There's also a little bit of a caveat that I have to throw out as we now have Hogger banned. I've seen him banned in pretty much every single game right now. Because we have 13 heroes banned, as I said, before all of this starts even. For the main event, when we're out of the group stage, when we're heading into the playoffs and the finals, we will have even more heroes banned. So that's something to definitely point out here already. So this is pretty much a little bit of a meta madness warm up, if you so will. Stukov gets picked again first. We had a very similar pattern already earlier on in our first game. So Stukov, definitely a high priority pick at this point for all of the teams, especially with heroes like Anna already banned out. ETC gets also taken quite quickly and we get Tychus again. And honestly, the Tychus pick doesn't come as a shock either. Chris is playing him here. So it's actually really, really cool to see Chris now also playing uh, again in Meta Madness here, so that's going to be fun as well. The number one in the Grandmaster letter. Uh, the captain on the side of the blue team, by the way, is Black Kidney, so he's playing on one of his uh, side accounts. I mean, he's been using that account a lot, so if you guys have any info about Black Kidney or seen him in the past, then you know that already. But here comes the Garrosh pick. The interesting part in one of the previous series was that if it goes to Game 3, tanks are starting to become a bit of a rare commodity. It also, of course, hinges a bit on how many of the main tanks have been banned, uh, have been played in the previous series. If there's any kind of like double combo happening or anything like that, but we definitely want to keep a bit of an eye on this one. For example, last time we had very few available. One of them was a Nuburak, but the teams didn't want to head into an Nuburak combo. You have to draft a very specific composition if you really want to be successful with that. You want to be aggressive and really snappy with your aggression there. But we'll see what happens for now. Gun of Terror. Tomb of the Garden Curse. Uh, we got Leo already banned, and there's the Maiev ban as well. But I'm a bit curious to see what Ty in particular is going to play. He's usually the one that goes for uh, the mobile assassins, and of course if you're looking towards the CCL, a lot of the European players have ping disadvantages and won't play certain heroes, or so even if they lock the heroes in, they won't play the same builds that they use in the European scene. Zeratul is a really good example. I mean, the main reason why Team Mene bans it out is Ty, obviously, on the other side. But, for example, if he's picked in the CCL, you will see even the European players just simply say, listen, we're not going to go for uh, for Might of the Nerezim, which is our standard talent to pick on the European server. But with the ping disadvantage, it's just too much of a problem when we're playing cross-server. So now that we're playing all of this out on the European server, there's a little bit of a different twist to it. And then you, of course, have to adjust your thinking in the draft as well because of that. Now with Thrall and Rhaegar taking, we're going full smork on this one. Very early Thrall pick, by the way. I expected Thrall to come out a bit later. Nano with Falstead, and we have Rexa as well. So we are getting some globals in play. I mean, one of the reasons why the Vikings were banned out was obviously also because this is a pretty big map right now. And therefore, if you can play with the Vikings, you can uh, do a whole lot of work. But that brings us to Blikitni. 
and therefore oh, normally the side lane. Are they going for some range damage on him or what he, is he going to play? Game number one, uh, we have Garden of Terror as our first map. And on the left side, Team Mene without Mene with Banana H on Stukov, as a right on Falstead, Sven on Rexa, Nano on Sylvanas, and Kamabear, the sub player for the team today, on Garrosh. Trolling Thunder already locked in for Blikitney as he's playing Thrall in our first game. On the right side of the map, Chris for the red team with Tychus, the will queue on ETC. That doesn't come as a shock. And we got Henning on Rega and Ty on Deathwing. All right, big map. I didn't expect this map to be picked first. This was more something that I could have seen picked later on in the series, but not so much. Now again, with the system that we're using for the group stage, if you are familiar with the GSL system from StarCraft 2, then you know exactly what's gonna happen here. So we already have to careful. Okay, that's an early kill. ETC is down. Yeah, so if you're familiar with that system, we already had our first match today and uh, Team Haas also was able to take down Team X-Ray. So they are now waiting in the winner's match for uh, their opponent. And the winner of this series is gonna go up against them. So uh, that will decide the first seed in this. Actually, nice. I like the Skinnergy here. Sven with a doubloon in silver. I like it. Looks good. We also got the stacking quest for Falstead. That's actually kind of interesting, honestly. If he goes for... Uh, it's it's kind of wild. The, normally you don't see the order attack quest all that much here because there's so many camps on the map that if you're going for the wingman on one, you will always get some value out of it. So it's kind of nice to see Azerite go for something different here. I mean, it's not that you have to go into wingman, but it's what I've seen most of the time. That would allow for quite some auto attack damage against Ty in particular later on. But always dragon against chicken usually ends up with false that being dropped into the KFC basket. So, yeah, that's that. Bot lane. First camp is already taken. Camp control is super important. This is also why a hero like Rhaegar on the support side is doing quite well for them here. Could go into uh, Bloodlust later on. He's still playing around the heel. Deathwing at the bot lane. Terror! Burning everything away here. And we also see straight in the mid lane. The push through those camps. <laughs> Carbon Bear comes in, pushes this one out easily. Yeah. Garage on those flips, honestly. Level 4 talents, that's the bigger they are, right there. And yeah, let's go. It's still weird to me to look at this and say, like, hey, this is game one. And we have Garden of Terror already. But hey, by all means. Possession for Sylvanas, big push at the top lane. And the bird is sitting there, it's like, eh, team, help, hi. Banana H coming in with the Admiral, trying to go for some big hits, and he's not the only one who makes an appearance. We have Come on Bear rotating in from the bottom, being in trouble right away, trying to go for the flip, body blocks, and there's the kill. Nice. Well done. And talking body blocks, but <laughs> how did he squeeze through there? I think he used that big arm to shove the cow to the side, but oh boy, it could have been two kills. So they get one, as a right saying like, yeah, let me stack, it's fine. Bottom of the map, the first seed has just spawned, and Deathwing is dealing with the camp now too. Yeah, but it's kind of it's kind of fun. The reindeer. I like that he used the skin that fits with the season. And I gotta say that living here in Spain, Christmas is a little bit meh in Spain. It's not quite the same as back home in Germany. Weather is way better. Don't get me wrong. But 18 to 20 degrees today don't really make up for Christmas markets and all that stuff. To be fair, in times of Corona, Christmas markets are not that big of a deal and usually not open. But again, when it comes to Christmas, uh, yeah, nothing beats home. Spain doesn't really do Christmas too well. Then again, Valencia in particular has fires and that's hard to beat. So there's that. Trade-offs, right? You win some, you lose some. Level 7 talents are in early on. And well, with that, we have no fucking way. Really? Really? <coughs> nope. Okay. God, I hate this talent. Alright, so he took the bait, he went into the secret weapon. Ah, on this map, really? You're the global that they have on this map, and that's the talent that you go. No boomerang, no quick stacking on the level one, no wave clear on the side. Dude, if you want an auto attacker, then pick something else. And Secret Weapon is shit. Secret Weapon is one of those talents where you have to have the theoretical best case scenario in order to get some value out of it, which in a real fight you normally just don't get. 
I can't believe that he picked Secret Urban. As a right, we gotta talk. Dude, we really gotta talk. Ugh. All right, all right, all right, all right. Deep breaths, Caldo, deep breaths. Woosa, woosa, go for the bad boys move right here. Okay, so let's ignore that for now. And let's take a little bit of a look. But yeah, macro game is going to be difficult for them now. I kind That also explains, by the way, it's one of the reasons why he didn't go wingman. It's going to be much harder for them, for him to uh, get a lot of that done. But still, they are losing out on quite a bit of the macro play that they technically could have had here. And of course, Deathwing is on the other side still, so it's not like... He's unopposed, but still. Banana H? Yeah, he got crushed right now. That was a rotation that he just didn't see coming. They cut his path of retreat off easily. And there's a bit of bot lane value that they have. So they can at least counteract that. And Ty has to be careful too, because, yep, gets attacked here. The chicken! He gets the kill! Sylvanas comes in, and the two of them just dive on him. They absolutely dive on Deathwing. Nano jumps on the wave, Azero barrel rolls in, Sylvanas disables the fort, the Deathwing kill, stage dive the level 10, and they get out. The fort is still in play, but they're gonna take this one easily. So now we got a stage dive, we have on top of that also the ancestral healing, got the earthquake in, and on the other side, of course, it is the mind control, right here. Okay, Coolio. Let's see what we're gonna get with that. And now Blikidne is already sitting tight. Chris, they're gonna go for the camp. At the bottom of the map, Falstad, he's gonna try and get a quick hit in here. Shouldn't really be a big problem for him. And the Will Q is trying to hold back. Honestly, I don't really think he can do a whole lot. If he wants the fort, then he's gonna get it. But the camp is now taken too, and ETC alone won't be able to stop this. Seeds have been claimed during all of this, on one on each side. Now they're going for tight here again. And, well, let's see. Rexa goes down. Topside gets attacked. Forza is going for a camp. Yep, they went in with the Earthquake. And down here, uh, hello? What is Deathwing doing? Dude, you are very much so alone right now. Okay, he needs to be really careful. Okay, drops the ult. That was kind of needed. Because, uh, yeah. There were four heroes around him. But they are going for a bit of a race now. Top fort has been taken. They go for camp two. That's a double camp push top side. Two mercenary camps that they could use to do this. Now there's two at the bottom of the map as well. I guess Falstad could easily move back and then use the gust. But he actually is flying into the middle of the map to catch the experience here. Don't think that was needed to burn the cooldown. I mean, Nano was pretty much already in position for it. Both are going for the defensive move now. 17 stacks from Falstad's level one, at least for now. And yeah, let's check this out. Two kills against three is actually fairly even so far. We have both teams with a couple of kills, both with moves on the auxiliary lanes, trying to take a couple of forts down, some very aggressive plays too, which I really like by the way. I like that barrel roll and uh, wave jump that we saw from the two, just totally ignoring the fort, disabling it quickly with Sylvanas, and Ty definitely underestimated the threat potential a bit in that situation, and got punished for it quickly. So, uh, for now, it's just all about the camps again, but let's not forget that with two seats in their hands, this one would technically give them the web uh, the, the thingies, the garden terrors. So, there's that. <laughs> Deathwing. The biggest nuisance of everybody that wants to channel something. But here we go, there's a bit of a lockdown attempt already, alright, let's go. Falstead has the giant killer, there's the Gust, Gust them away. Chris is still trying to get some value out of Odin as they're zoning them as hard as they can. But he's gonna drop out of the mech pretty soon and they're still trying to fight this one out. Level 13 talent as usual, also the Earth Shield now. Need to get that extra time to get the Ancestral through. But the red team is forced to fight, unless they want to face the objective, they are forced to make a move here. Will Q doesn't have uh, more speed this time. Oh, oh, good lockdown. Nicely done, but the cleanse is ready. And here comes Deathwing again, diving in deep. As a right, he gets the damage. Garrosh sets it up, and that's a kill. Banana Age is being saved by the slow, and they are starting to get mad value here. But Nano is low, but they're turning it against Henning. Rega with the self ancestral. And Falstead might have to make a move. Nah, Common Bear is ready. He's coming in with Garrosh and he's zoning them out. That is going to be a curse. They are doing extremely well here. Oh my god. There comes the quick hit against ETC. Four kills to three. Nicely done. Solid plays. Really solid plays from them. Deathwing do his thing again. 
19k for the bird, 14k for Sylvanas, 23k for Tigers. Nobody. This is Odin, but still. Azerite at the bot lane now, pushing this out, getting more stacks together, dealing with Chris. And he gets burned on very, very quickly in that situation, but Chris can't stay here. He's too alone. He has vision at the top side. He knows that there's at least three, but he needs to move back once the garden Terra touches ground. And now, of course, we have four kills to three, an entire level lead, and it's going to get worse from here on out since those Garden Terrors are pushing the lanes, and that is at least resulting in a fourth destroyed at the top, but they're also pushing all the lanes back. That gives them a huge amount of map control, which means that once that this is over, they are going to go for camps, and they can easily take them, having full vision of the map, more or less. Even a bit of mid lane pressure, and of course, the Kitty's team is now put into a position where they have to make a choice. Do they go for the top lane and defend? Do they defend the bot lane or do they try and hold that forward but here comes the aggression and the bird is about to go down deathwing wants a snack and he does oh six hit points oh my god thralls lightning nearly bounced on this thing and that could have been the end of it actually it did bounce on it just didn't do enough damage six hp on false death whoa yeah, the top lane has taken some more damage. Now they have the level 16 talents. And there we go. That's unstoppable frames for Sylvanas. And False that has now with the afterburner the chance to get out of these fight situations a little bit quicker. Yeah, he needs to spec heavily into that auto attack. I mean, they are trying to use him as the main damage dealer with this now. So once the quest is completed on level 1, they can do a whole lot with that. Uh, let's see what they can do here. Best move, you're throwing the boomerang or the uh, hammerang into the other side, then you activate the afterburners and fly over to the right, which allows you another two auto attacks. That's how you get value out of secret weapon, that's how you make that play. You get the 16 talent, you throw it into the wrong direction, and then you make the distance between yourself and that hammer as big as possible while still stutter stepping and getting some hits in. Ah, big boy plays, right here. Ty is trying to do what he can, but he can only sniff this one out. I mean, it's 16 versus 16 now. And we have a bit more of a focus from Chris now also in the, uh, the armor piercing round, so it's all about the overkill. Synergy on Rhaegar is also ready with his level 1 and his level 16 now that he picked up the Earth Grasp totem. So there we go. And yeah, let's keep an eye also on Rexa. He's playing this really safe. Could take the walls down too to deny a bit more vision on the opponent's side. But they are slowing down a bit now. It's 16 versus 16 talents, but you're level ahead, so you really want to bring this advantage towards 20 and only fight for things that you have to, unless you find a good situation where you feel you have a, you have a lead. Damage output, as I said, I mean, look at Tigers, 32,000. Look at Deathwing, 30k. They got the damage. The problem is they can't really get the kills that they want. Topside gets pressured. Fight is there, though. Yeah, that choke point is not something that you want to engage into, on the other hand. So you got to be careful with how you approach this. And they go for the triple channel. Always have to deal with Deathwing. And yep, there it is. Deathwing interrupting again. And boy, that must be so annoying. Yep. And he's easily hitting both of them, of course. Triple channel now. Trying to bait this out. And it's just like, ugh. Let's go middle instead. Let's take the fort. Screw Deathwing. Let's take the fort. Let's force them into a reaction. Earthquake. Stage dive. Mind control. They go for Come on Beard. And he's about to go down. That's the end of it. He's dropped, false that wasn't even there. Four kills to four, and thanks to Deathwing, they can still go for the seed, and they make the play for it. Ah, it gets interrupted for just a second, but it seems like Deathwing wants to snack up Nisha, and that's exactly what happens. I'm still of the opinion that you should uh, be, you should have like a special ability. There needs to be some interaction between specific heroes, and I think every single time that Deathwing gets approached by either Murky or by Deathwing, he should be allowed to just gobble them up and kill them. If you get into melee range against one of the two, you should just simply be allowed to eat them. I mean, seriously? A bear is gonna attack a dragon? Are you kidding me? It's never gonna happen. No, he's just gonna move in and he's gonna eat that thing. It's called a snack. Hello? Bot lane. That's at least one of the walls that is about to fall here. If they don't... Yep, but Chris is going for it. So, yeah, they're forced back the entire time now. They lost so many structures. They lost all of the forts. So that's a bit of pressure through catapults. As the game continues, those are going to scale. It's going to make it more difficult. But, yeah. Stacks are slowly coming in. And that especially is true for Rexa, who now completed his own quest. So that's good. But, of course, we're going to keep our eye on Falset in particular. He needs to still be the main damage dealer for them. And once the level 1 quest is completed, that's going to be even more so the case. 
but he just can't hold a candle to the damage that we're seeing coming in from Tychus. But of course, that doesn't really doesn't really tell anything just yet. It's 18 and a half versus 18 and a half, and uh, Team Mena is doing even without Mena fairly well here today. They started off with a real strong push, and now they have taken a significant amount of structures out already. But they have to also face this particular fight, because if not, then the, the Garden Terrors are going to come. Every single time I'm talking about these things, I want to call them Web Weavers. I can't be the only one. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So, the Garden Terrors. Yep, they are going to descend, uh, burrow through, whatever, once that the seed is taken. So, the blue team has to go for it. Bot lane, that was a neat move though, taking that camp away, those siege shines. Guys, that bot lane, if they can stall this out, this is gonna do work. This is really gonna do work. Technically, this could end up with a keep fall. If they're a little bit lucky with the timings, then again, come on Baird, he gets toasted, and there's the barbecue. Ty going for the big barbecue moves, Death Ping gets attacked very quickly by Force. That that's really where Giant Killer kicks in. Giant Killer is just so good against the high hit point pool hero, but they're taking it. There it is. Garden Terrors are in. They only get the wall out of this. They couldn't stall it out longer than that. If they could, it would have been great. ETC is the one defending because he has the global. He has the stage dive. He can jump to the top and just take it from here. And yeah, they're coming in for it now. Top wall is already being uh, disabled, so now they can easily go for the keep. ETC didn't have to make a move yet. Both teams are looking for the 20. Misha is down. It's time for Storm Talents, everybody. Their big red button is in. They go for the shield. Here come the plays. The big engage on Sven. And they're trying to take him down. The jump doesn't connect with anything, but the keep is going to fall. They're going to get that keep. That keep is gone. And they seem like... Are they? No. Okay. For just a moment, it looked like they are trying to make a play here. Instead, they are still getting some damage out from Falstead, but the bird is just not able to drop them yet. Ty, <laughs> try and kill her, my friend. You need to be careful of this. All right, there we go. And they're retreating again. Not a whole lot. Damage output. 28,000 for the bird, 22,000 for Sylvanas. 50,000 for Tykes. And on the side of Deathwing, 46k, 34 for Thrall. Uh, over here. Yeah, I guess maybe. Another wave coming in, but that doesn't really look too good either. So cams are being stolen away. That's the focus for now. But let's go. Nice lockdown. Can they follow up on it? The mind control. But they just don't have it. They just don't have the output here. Well, come on, Bear instead. is low and he gets murdered. Ty wants to escape. Gets body blocked for just a second. And here comes a gust for the disengage. This play game is on point, but unfortunately for them, that's all that they could get through. Now we have the Siege Giants also taken, and things are getting real bad for Team Aena. Yeah, damage output is a problem. That damage is a bit of an issue for them now. They're trying to set Falser up so that he can do the main damage, but the combo isn't really working as well as they were probably hoping for. Now if he can scale more into the late game, if he can get the stacks together for his level 1, get the activatable, they might be able to burn Tide out. They really have to play a whole lot around the Giant Killer setup, but it's really, really difficult to make that work. And Tai, of course, if he knows that too, he can play maybe a little bit more passive, stay a bit farther in the back. There's of course always the problem that you can't just simply drop a heal on Deathwing. So there's that, it would be a bit Imba too, but still. Now the seat is popping up, but top lane, Falset has to deal with this. And this is really where the problem uh, comes in that he doesn't have Boomerang. As much as you rely on it now for, I would say, teamfight uh, damage, you want to have in this situation a Boomerang so that he can take all of this down super quickly and then rejoin the fight. As it happens, Team Blakini is even not even trying to go for a battle. They just give this one up, at least initially. They will take it later, or try to. But they give Falset that time to push the top lane out one way or another, which should also result in the quest being completed. So he should get it from, uh, from here. Even if he, especially if he waits for the next wave, then 100%. Four kills against seven and still looking for the angle. Bot lane is also getting pushed. Bot lane is in a very similar spot than what we've seen earlier for the bottom keep on uh, the red team side. If nobody takes care of that, it's gonna fall. They go for, uh, for Misha again. Fallstat now has the quest completed. Hello? Uh, yep, yeah, that's the kill. That's what? Yeah, that's the kill. There it is, they have to kill him, and they do. Deathwing with the final blow, but oh boy, they nearly saved him. 
the bird is on the run. Uh, and gets zoned out easily by Chris. They're getting the seed. They defend the bot lane now instead, but it's just camp after camp after camp that gets taken now by Blikitmi and his team. And they are just doing so much work here. I mean, they're going for the bottom fort now too. They're just trying to gain more and more map control. And also a lead in experience. It's not that there's any talents left, but again, even just having a level lead gives you a stats advantage, which can become a very impactful thing. Right now, it doesn't really seem like one of the teams is going to get a big advantage on this one anytime soon. Quest, by the way, isn't even completed yet for Garrosh, so he hasn't completed his level 1 yet. Still working on it. But yeah, 4 kills to 8. It's uh, it's a bit rough for Team Aiden now. They did initially a really good job, I think, and they had also with the first objective a very solid push that allowed them to take multiple structures down, but now they are in a position where it's just getting more and more dangerous for them to really stay this far out, and the fights that they are forced into are just not really doing anything for them. They need a bit more lockdown, they need some kind of isolation, they are looking at mind control mainly as a tool. Falstad has used Gust so far only as a disengage, so with a nice mind control they might be able to do something, but they really have to pull this off somehow so that Falstad can connect the damage. And as more, the more he stacks, the better. Like, his level 1, the baseline, is gonna do so much. He's at 43 now. But uh, they're trying to play, now they're trying to play a global game. And that brings me back to Boomerang. If you're all of a sudden trying to play a macro game against your opponent, then you're talking Boomerang. That's what you kind of want. Of course, that's tricky if you're up against, yes, exactly that, stage dive. Banana H makes it easily out of the fight, and the rest of the team is already defending. Deathwing is now moving in, and Ty has to be careful that he's not all of a sudden the recipi uh, recipient of uh, the opponent's gank. But now there's even... Uh, couple of siege giants that are pushing in the top lane, so the bird is the one to deal with it again. Just doesn't have the same wave clear. So they try. Damage output. Sylvanas has now taken over also as the main damage dealer for the blue team. 65,000. He has twice the amount of damage that Sylvanas and Falstad have. 52 for Deathwing. Thrall on 44. Yeah, they need a kill. They, they need an isolation. But there's, it's really a problem. The Kitty's team is playing it very, very smart. They're not offering them anyone. Now that the 20 is in, you could see, I mean, they're throwing everything in here. If you go for the mind control on 20, which they did, the Dark Nade is called, they can technically even try to make that play into one of those bushes. Mind control already getting used here for the first time, but look at Garrosh, he's already low. Kitty bolts away, he just zoned them again, and they are gonna get the Garden Terrors. Yeah, this is looking real bad for Team Aene. They just can't hold that position there. And Odin alone zones them out completely. And that allows Henning to go for an easy channel. They're going to grab this one. And now this is going to be painful. Bot lane. Yeah, there's a stage dive. Comes in, gets locked down. Is that the kill? Is that it? Yes, that's it. They get the kill. Too greedy. They overplayed their hand a little bit. They might not get the keep now. This will, be, this will be an interesting one. The plan gets burned down immediately. With ETC gone, that's a huge problem. Wilkie thought they could go for the aggressive play, but it turned out to not be the case. Now, this is the first one of the Garden Terrors that gets taken out. Chris is flanking in. Yeah, and makes it out. They tried again with the mind control, but it just doesn't work the way that they want. They can't isolate the targets properly. Now we have also the mid fort about to be uh, claimed. But honestly, if they only get that, that's not worth it. If they only get the mid four, that is just simply not worth it. Plain and simple. That ETC attack, that aggression didn't do anything for them at all. Huge problem. If they just played it out slow, they would have done so much more, but they thought they could get another kill. And yeah, they were simply too greedy. Simple as that. And Falstad, he has 53 stacks now. So as a right, again, his on-point burst damage, thanks to the activatable, and his continuing stacking, is in the late game going to start to become a bit of a problem for heroes like Deathwing in particular. He went secret weapon, which again, eh, but now that he has it, and now that he has giant killer, he might be the one to drop a target. If they can lock it down a little bit or just get a good position, he might be the one. He's looking for the damage, and he's sitting at, well, 41,000. Falls, well... <laughs> Falstad is down. He gets the wind tunnel, but he gets dropped here quickly. ETC jumps in, and now the bird is dead. And that is the beginning of the end, I suppose. Look at how aggressive Ty is. 
He goes in, might even fall for the play, but even if he does, it's worth it. Down goes Deathwing, but so do Garrosh and also Stukov. They're going for Sven, and that is the end of Raxa. This is it. Five-man wipe, ladies and gentlemen. Team Blakitney comes in, they go through the keep straight for the core, and they lock in a victory on map number one, Tomb of the Garden Curse. Nicely done, 13 kills to six. Got a bit closer here, a couple of good moves from Team Aina, but the red team successful at the end of the day. They lock in the 1-0 lead in the best of three series at Group A of Meta Madness. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two. Let's go, everybody. Team Mena against Team Blee Kidney, and the red team has taken the lead after the first map. Great game on uh, Tomb of the Garden Curse. Now we're heading into Infernal Shrines, which is our second map. And of course, there's going to be a lot more heroes banned. Keep in mind that all of the heroes that you've seen in game number one in the actual game, they are all banned out now, which in total puts this now to 23 heroes banned before we are heading into the draft. So with the six that will be banned out now, you have 29 eliminated. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going full meme or anything in those drafts, so there's still plenty of heroes around that you can pick that will be quite meta, but it's kind of nice to not always see the same heroes in every single game. And at the same time, also, we might see a couple of adjustments that make things a bit interesting, because all of a sudden you could think about some combos that might not work in a normal meta, simply because they can easily be countered by specific meta picks. Now, my F gets banned here. Uh, and they're going also for a ban on Orphea, first of all. I mean, Infernal Shrines, we saw Kalthas in one of the previous games, and mages are usually pretty good here too. So Gul'dan is another example of a hero you could pick. Hogga! Hogga gets banned time and time again. We've seen him a few times in the CCL, but right now in Meta Madness, everybody's just saying like, Nope! That ain't happening. We're not gonna deal with Hogga. We're not gonna deal with that unstoppable stuff. It is not gonna be a thing. So let's find out what exactly is going to happen in uh, this particular draft. Because I'm a little bit curious how Team Mena is going to adjust to that. And again, I said it before, I say it again. They play with a sub today. Obviously, Mena missing is a big problem. But it was one of those things. I mean, it's just like one of those shit happen situations. It was a call on short notice that he had to follow. So nothing we can do about that. His team is honestly fighting pretty hard. To make sure that they have a chance. Lock some wins in here. So one of the first things that we get is a Junkrat. Okay, so Junkrat gets played. Uh, that's actually that's actually kind of interesting that the, he wasn't even banned out. On Infernal Shrines, he's just insane when you can poke from the outside of the shrines. And of course, if there is a stun and you set a good mine up, you can always create a kill opportunity for your team too. So there's that. But, well, let's have a bit of a look. Carrigan! Okay. Carrigan and Jimmy. All right, guys. That is gonna be fun. Carrigan and Jimmy are in. God, I love that we have Carrigan. I mean, normally when you're looking at that, you're kind of thinking about Nick mainly, right? Like, he's the one that you usually look for, but now we have Reyna being played as well. So it seems like Chris is just rotating through StarCraft heroes at this point. He's just looking at this saying like, okay, Tychus is out, I played him in game number one, what are you playing in game number two? You know what? There's this other guy that's also awesome. He's also from the StarCraft universe. Okay, a Nubarak as a main tank. Which kind of means that they want to be aggressive with this. So they will dive in. Maybe even follow up with just Junkrat and try to lock something out here. But we'll, we'll see. Alright, so bans on Anduin. Yeah, you want to make sure that whatever the target is of that combo... Uh, first of all, there's a couple of things. The Yanubarak setup, whatever combo you're trying to use here, you want to make sure that Anduin just doesn't pull the target out. And the same is also true when Leo comes in with an Entomb. If you're trying to play even around a Buried Alive later on and you don't hit Anduin himself, then you don't want to be in a situation where, well, uh, the guy comes in and just like he simply saves the target. So that's not really a cooldown exchange that you're going to be happy about. So, yep. And now that I say it... I'm actually realizing that the red team banned out Anduin. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm also like preparing the ban sheets for the player so that they know what's banned, what's still available. So sometimes I have to like look over there and check that out too. So I missed that initially. But that makes it a bit weird, honestly. I guess they are more so worried about their own stun composition being denied through it. 
but I would be more worried if he was on the other side. So it's an interesting ban that they are going for here. I mean, again, a Nuburat with Anduin would be allowed to be way more aggressive, so that's true. So if you have a Nuburat with Anduin, then you can first of all make a light bomb setup happen. That's one tool. And you can also like get a Nuburak out. Now he has to be a bit more careful when he dives in. But I would have been a bit more worried about what happens when you're setting up a Leoric in two and all of these things. But again, fair enough. Both sides have some reasons to bat him out, I suppose. But not really what I expected here. Uh, either way, now that we're having our last pair, uh, our last pick coming in with Hans and Deckard Kane taken, we'll see what exactly Ty is going to play in game number two. Deathwing is obviously now gone, as he was played in the last game. Uh, but yeah, so they're going to go... Yeah, we have the Nubarak, they can even fall over the Hanzo arrow, and they have Deckard Kane. It's a fair amount of CC that they're now rocking. And Zaratul! There we have our Zaratul pick! Alright, we talked about this earlier. Kerrigan and Zaratul. Boy, they're aggressive in this game now. Holy hell, they're getting aggressive over here. I like it. So guys, let's go in game number two in our best of three series and see which team is taking the... Yeah, the winner in Inferno Shrines and maybe even the entire series. We'll find out in just a second. Game on! Team Mena against Team Black Kidney. Well, here we go. We got on the left side Sven on Leoric for the blue team. We got Banana H on Deckard Kane. As a right on Hanzo. Camembert on Nuburak. And Nano on Junkrat. So, let's go. Let's check that out. On the right side of the map, it's Team Blakitney with the 1-0 lead in the best of three series here in the group stage. With Blakitney himself on Carrigan. We get the Will Kill Murden, Chris on Reyna, Ty is playing Zeratul, and Henning on Malfurion. I'm gonna be honest, I really think that Ty is gonna be pretty relieved that he can play his hero again on the European server where he doesn't have to deal with ping disadvantages and you can immediately see that the build is deviating away from what we see in played in the CCL whenever Zeratul is picked. Shadow Hunter on level 1. And yeah, this game is gonna be a really good example of the meta difference on a hero between two regions. So now for level one, we got on Anubarak the Legion of Beetles. We had that a few times in the past already. It's really coming too much as a big surprise here. Multiple ways that you can go for with Anubarak. Top side, Sven is gonna play this out against Ty at the bottom of the map. They're looking for some aggression and both teams are obviously looking for this. Oh, oh, oh come on there. Jumping out, the turnaround. Nice combo from Blikitni and the follow-up from Henning is there but they just don't have the damage yet. Another five versus four, they're jumping in again. They want the bug but they can't lock the beetle down. Leo is still at the top, zoning this out and now he could technically, once he gets that, try and slow down the Zeratul rotation to deny some of the experience to him. But that is a nice opening into the game. I like that. So over here, Likitne. Careful. Yeah, gets attacked again. But Carrigan is always looking for that combo. Awesome's renewal on level 1 for Leo now. And of course, Team Ana hopes that they can force game number 3 in the series. Gonna be quite eager to make that work. But we'll, we'll see. And yeah, Team Hazel is of course waiting in the winner's match. But we're gonna see after this one. Either way, level 4 is slowly approaching. We have both of them going for their Kazra camp, but there's still one camp at the bottom of the map, and the blue team is a bit slower. So there's the initial lead for Blikitney's team, and they claim it. They take the camp. Slight lead. Muradin with the Storm Ball, jumping in aggressively. Will Q wants the stacks. He commits, by the way, to... Oh, careful. He commits, by the way, to the double club. So we're going to see a traditional healing static build. Oh my god, the double grab and the kill. Beautiful combo here from Blikitney. Nicely done. Yeah, Nick is not the only one that can play carry again. Look at this. Jumps in, gets pushed out again, goes for the second approach on this one. Hits two, and then they get the easy kill against Hanzo. Really, really well done by them. And that's the, uh, the initial kill at least. But now it's time for the camps to be taken. The shaman camps, of course, because it's all about the top shrine for now. Top Shrine is going to be the next one, and yep, yeah, level 4 talents gave us, amongst other things, the Psionic Strength. Leo, of course, with the extra wave clear. Neil Peasants. And the Shielding Potion for Deckard Kane. Okay, so, Zeratul is still rotating, I mean, he has the wave clear for them, but once that he's coming into the later stages of the game, he's going to jump into their backline and take Zeratul and Hanzo out, or at least try to. Uh, take Junkrat and Hans out. Old man as well. 
So yeah, Tai is gonna get more and more mobility as all of this continues, but for now he has to meet the Leoraki rotation. He can't just give up on experience, he has to need to do something with this. But there's the combo again. Zeratul and Leo fighting out the bot lane. Over here though, bit of a body block. Come on, Bear gets out, and Malfurion is dead, but they get the counter kill against Hanzo. Hanzo gets murdered once more, the guy with the hipster beard doesn't make it. Now the level 7 comes through and that gives us immediately the wormhole. Wormhole is in, tons of mobility here as all of this continues for Zeratul. With level 7 we even get the leeching scarabs. So Camembert is already sitting there like, um, team, I'm having a bit of a problem. The solo kill, by the way, from Ty at the bot lane. Alright, so he gets the 1 versus 1 trade into Leo. And up at the top, it's again all about objective number one. The Punisher, another Storm Ball is hitting. Muradin is able to jump out. Careful, they lock him down. Will you in trouble? Is that a kill? Yes, it is. They get the kill. And at the bottom of the map, Leo gets attacked immediately again. Zaratul is doing tons of work right now against him. He himself needs to be careful too. But up here at the top, the fight continues as the Carrigan combo misses the mark this time. And the quest is completed for Zeratul now. They lose out on the objective though. Nicely done. The attack here, still going strong. Ty, careful. The leech is there, but he makes it out. Arcane Punisher topside now for Team Mane. As they are trying to claim a victory in the second game. Bait over the wall, there it is. Easier defense for them. Chris gets booted back, finds himself on the outside. There's the stun and there's the kill. Well done. They get Mane. As a right, survives. With pretty much no hit points, he makes it out. But it was a beautiful setup by Junkrat. That was honestly quite strong. Good kill against Chris. They isolate him here. But yeah, let's take another look at this. Ah, well, actually, let's wait and see what happens with Carrigan. Carrigan is also dead. Team Mena can't stop, won't stop. What is that? Kill after kill, double stun heading. Oh my god, they're crushing. They are absolutely crushing now. Come on, Bear, he's low on mana. There's a storm bolt against the old man. Can they get out? Uh, Zaratul wants a kill, but he can't get it. Leo is at the bottom of the map, but take a look at the initial kill. Check this out. They boop him over the wall, and then they can immediately jump on the target and just blow him up. They save Hanzo too, which was honestly not all that easy, but that was really, really well done. Five kills to three, and they are ahead. I love how they are just bringing the aggression right now. They're not intimidated after game one whatsoever. And now that heroics are out, there's of course always the forced play that you can engage into with a simple drop on your cocoon. So if they can lock someone down, I mean it's also the easiest setup for for Leo. Cocoon, uh, sorry, entomb the cocoon. There it is, by the way, the level 10. So that's a bit of a new thing for all of the NA fans. Might of the Nerezim. No Void Prison in this game. Super hyper mobile build now for Ty. And he is. Now he has obviously in the late game team fights. He will have to prove how strong he is with the Zeratul. But he already got his solo kill against Leo. And he is still holding on the side lane. And he's going for Leo again. Jumping in and out the entire time for a little bit more of Pope. But now that he has the Might of the Nerezim, he can apply even more pressure. And I think that's going to be a big problem later on for the backliners on the blue team side. But so far they've done really well. And even if Kuhn could be used at some point for those plays. Yeah, Tai is not stopping, comes in and gets the solo kill again. Kid is just popping off here once more. And Sven is sitting at the side and he's just like, Jesus, can you get off my ass just for a second, please? Five, two, four, Zeratul is doing his thing. Still trying to guard the top lane as the rest of the red team is now taking their shaman camp. Next objective should be announced very, very soon. And, well, experience gap is closing. It's a small lead that we still have for Team Mena, but it's not big, it's not huge. So, right now, there we have our thing with Banana Age all the way up at the top, taking the next one. Alright, for now, so far so good. And, well, let's see what the second objective can do here. Because right now, they're starting to kind of jump in immediately into the mid lane with the attempt to get the second Punisher. Level 13 talents are of course now up for grabs before the objective even spawns. Zeratul has to do his thing on the side again, which he does. 16 stacks for the baseline on Muradin, so still a bit far away from getting all of his tools in. But let's have a bit of a look here. Here we go. There it is. The double and tomb and the Riptire. In the back line, Jimmy is isolated. Henning is about to go down. Stay a while and get wrecked, baby. 
Deckard Kane comes in and they drop him. But Camo Bear is low. Blakitni wants the kill. He doesn't get it. Tai is moving out of the fight, but he gets murdered by Hanzo. And so does Kerrigan. Nicely done. Big kills. Big kills here from the blue team. Really well done. The attempt at a kill from Zeratul, but Hanzo follows up on it. And then Kerrigan dies as well. That's two more kills. A to four now. They're playing a fantastic game here. I love how they are locking these heroes down and get the control. We said it from the beginning. It's a super aggressive setup that we're seeing from Team Blake Hitney, And it's just not really working out at this point. Here comes the aggression again. As they're starting to come through the mid lane. Top damage, by the way, for Zeratul here. Ty obviously trading a lot into Leoric here in the mid lane, or in the, sorry, in the mid game and in the early game. Healing static for Muradin, that's a big one for him right now. Zeratul with the mending strikes, 23,000 for Junkrat, he can just drop that poke. And the fights continue. Yeah, Blakitne is gonna look for the aggression, Zeratul is gonna look for the follow up. But they have to hold on to their structures and they are losing so much ground on the map now. They're just losing way too much here. Now again, the level 13 synergy with Muradin is going to be huge for him. Having the healing static is going to be uh, really important. But I still have my eye on uh, the aggressive players for the red. Especially Tai. Again, his hero was banned out on map number one for a reason. Now he gets it. The problem for him is really the amount of CC that we have on the blue team side. There's a cocoon that can always be dropped if uh, the shit hits the fan. And the old man can also come in with a quick stay a while this if he has to. But the mobility from Zeratul and Tai in particular, together with Dino and a few others, the top Zeratul players on the European server, they can rip a backline apart. But not if the fight starts like this. He's gonna try, but can he get the damage in? Rip Tai is already out, and Uberak is dead. He jumps onto Nano, tries to take down Junkrat. Super low, moves out again. Azerite is trying to follow up, but Tai is at least for now escaping. Moves back out. Always playing around the cooldowns here and is able to drop some damage, distract it in the back line, move back out, move in again, quick slice as they are starting to push them back. Nice back and forth here between the two teams. Really, really liking this. A lot of potential still for Play Team Blake Kidney to bring it back, but the lead goes to Team Mana for now and they are looking for a level 16. They want that big advantage to play on. Obviously, 16 is also going to be interesting what we're going to get. Muradin is also something that we need. But let's have a bit of a look here. The Kidney is coming in, starting to take this down at the bottom. We also have the Burning Beetles in play. And a traditional build for Leoric, just mentioning it. So we got the, uh, the Ominous Wraith in. Royal Focus will follow. We need to soak the experience right now, and that's what Tai is currently doing. So he's starting to move straight up to the top and is doing his thing here. Epicenter is going to be huge in these fights, makes the engage even more powerful. 24,000 damage by now for Zeratul, 18,000 for Chris, who has been struggling a bit since most of the attacks were f honestly going for him, or at least trying to. 31,000 here for Junkrat. And well, let's have a little bit of a look. Zeratul is playing the top lane out against Sven again. I mean, he's sitting also at 51,000 siege damage, but he can't keep up with Leo. But now they're moving in as a duo. Tai gets some easy damage, and they're pushing him back out. But they have to be careful themselves now, because with that move coming in, that gank could be brutal. Zeratul sees it. Very likely gonna just jump out. Yeah, stays hidden as long as he can. And there's the talents now, finally. We got 16. And that gives us, for Zeratul, also the Master Warp Blade right here. Whereas for Muradin, we got the Dwarf launch, so he has the increase launch right now. Okay, so, for now, let's see what they can actually pull off on the next objective. We got even talents, that was the important part. We need to make sure they close the experience, and then you can fight on uh, my footing. Leo has to move back again. Lost the one on one against Zeratul once more. So Tai was able to force him to Hearth back to the Nexus. But let's see what else they can do. Can they win the objective? Honestly, it's all about the objective right now. If that gets taken as well, that could be the first keyboard of the game. So right now, Team Blake Kidney, they have to make a move. But they're already getting attacked right here. Tai jumps out, doesn't want to get locked down by this. We got the cleave. And Will Q is going to attempt to slow this down. Can get the Stormbolt in, has not completed the quest yet. He did not go into Sledgehammer on level 4, so it takes him a lot longer to complete it. Yeah, they're going again for carry again. The combo doesn't hit. There's the Entomb, they're jumping out, and the arrow misses completely. The old man moving in with another old 
They take Kerrigan down though. Chris is trying to drop some damage. The Cocoon on Zeratul. Ah, he couldn't do anything in the fight. Gets Cocooned immediately. Still poking this out as much as he can. Jumps in, jumps out. Finds himself on the wrong fight, or wrong side of the team fight. 21 to 27 stacks now. Muradin jumps out too. Ty with another play attempt. Gets out with a bling, gets slowed, and he's really making them work for the kill, but they can't get it. They're chasing him, they're wasting so much time for him, but it doesn't matter because there's only three more players besides him, so there's nothing that the red team can do. They lost Kerrigan just way too early. Zeratul makes it out. They have to deal with the top lane, and oh boy, that is the third Punisher now. Yeah, it's just the composition that doesn't really work for them here. So they are getting pressured more and more, and it's some beautiful games, uh, or it's some beautiful combos, honestly, that we get from Team Mena. And cocooning Zeratul, I talked about this earlier. This is, is going to be a problem for Ty, and it was such a good move. They didn't have to care. They didn't have to care, care of the backline again. They didn't have to be afraid of anybody jumping on the damage dealers or the support. They could focus all the way up at the front. Another arrow missing, by the way, and off we go. He jumps out. There's no 20 yet. Ty is looking for the engage, but look at Camembert. He sees him and he's just saying, no, dude, it's not happening. You're not making it into my backline. Such a good zoning move here from them. Will Q is low, gets stunned, and yep, that's the end of him. Ty gets attacked immediately. Nicely played here. I really, really like how that front line of Team Mena is always guarding the backline. They are peeling their ass off for those guys. Honestly, there's a ton of teams that have failed to do that in the past, that have been destroyed by a single hero. But here, they're dropping the cocoon, they're dropping the stuns, they're always zoning, keeping the body in, and they're doing so well with it. And you can really tell that the coordination that we're seeing from the blue team is paying off. They got the keep at the bottom of the map, they're making a play for the middle, but maybe they overstepped slightly. Sven gets attacked. Ty wants the kill, jumps in, jumps out, goes back, tries still for the kill, but he just can't do enough alone, escapes the Entomb now too. Ty is just insane on the mobility, but they need to capitalize on these plays. It's not enough to just like dance around them six days to Sunday, you need to capitalize on it. They get a kill on Leo, but Kerrigan falls, and now Malfurion is dead too. They lose too many heroes here, and he's low, he's dodging out on the damage that Hanzo tries to push on him, but he needs to go back to the Nexus, there's nothing you can do. HP is just way too low right now, Keep gets attacked, and that's 12 kills to 6 now. It's honestly impressive what Mena's team is pulling off here, even without their captain today. Keep number two is down, and now they have, of course, level 20 for the next fight, which also allows them to get the Buried alive. Which means Zeratul is even more in trouble. I mean, Bullseye, Respect the Elderly, Buried Alive, and a Rewind. Ty had issues with all the CC on the other side already. Now it's even more of an issue. Yeah, they are in deep shit now. One level is... Ah, one level is missing for 20, so sh they should be able to get there. But can they really win an objective here? Two keeps down? Lanes alone are gonna push you. They haven't taken a fort down yet. There's not a single fort that was destroyed yet, so that makes matters even worse for them. Because there's gonna be continuous pressure. Look at that minimap. Camps on all the lanes, catapults pushing in. Oh my god. It's really problematic. Yeah, this is this is getting kind of crazy. Yeah, the combo is just not working out. Kerrigan is just dying too early. It worked in the early game, but now they need someone else. I mean, right now, look at the damage output. Zeratul is still the main damage dealer. He's not supposed to be the one that always draws the attention completely. The rest of the team has to be able to make the four-man work as well, and that's just not happening. If the four-man works, then Ty can pop off. But the foreman is engaging and immediately the damage is pushed onto Kerrigan. She's about to die. They have to try to go for a saving move. They can't really. And once she's gone, they're playing with less numbers. So, yeah. The rest of the team, the foreman needs to be in the spot where they can do more work so that they can take the focus a little bit off Zeratul and allow him to make some plays. And he's already doing some damage with them. Sven gets attacked, they're trying to follow up on it, and it's good damage, but he has awesome renewal, he gets immediately healed by Deckard Kane. Here comes another play for Kerrigan, buried alive! Can they play around it? They're trying! Kerrigan, is she dying again? No, they save her, they save her! The Hans arrow might have just saved Sven too. Ooh, Meridin, they're so low, and Kerrigan is dead again. Kerrigan is just dying too much here, they can't keep her alive. 
Spiritin jumps out. Chris is stepping up to the plate, trying to take Nano down. Zeratul barely alive as he's still looking for opportunities. He just can't get them and look at the core. Catapults moving in from every single angle. It's Winion time, baby. It is Winion time. They know they are likely going to lose if they lose out on the Punisher, but they are also starting to not only lose the shields, but also points on the core. The Winions are already locked in, and the core is falling quickly, way too quickly. That's the end of Reyna. Ty comes through and takes the last few catapults down, but as you can tell, they are going to end the game right here. Seems like we're going to head into game three. We're not there yet, but it seems impossible to hold this. Ty gets attacked and Zaratul finally dies. Finally they were able to take the kill. And that's three heroes down. That is game over. And we will head into a third game, everybody. We're gonna get that third game. Muradin is dead too. Carrigan is back. But that doesn't change anything anymore. Catapults on the core. So are the five heroes. The Punisher is moving in. Awesome. We got a draw. We're going the full distance again. Team Mena with a win on Infernal Shrines against Team Blakeney. Towers of Boom, everybody! Okay, game three. We're kind of lucky. Two group stage matches and both of them go the full distance immediately. Last one was kind of insane. I mean, honestly, Ty was playing his heart out with the mobility here, but they just could not keep Carrigan alive. They were looking for kills, looking for lockdowns. Sometimes they got them, but the blue team, they survived. They turned it around, they pushed against Carrigan, and they just killed them there. So now the Vikings get banned again. They definitely don't want to go up against that Viking style, you can tell. They banned them on game number one, they banned them in game number two. Map choice was made by uh, the blue team. Team Mena chose the map, first pick choice for the red team. So now Mayev gets banned out again. Coffin Girl also immediately eliminated. But Towers is going to be a fun one. And again, now we already have 20... 33! 33 heroes banned out as we're heading into this, with another 6 bans coming in through the draft, that will be 39 in total. More once that we're heading into the main event, obviously, as I mentioned, we're still in the group stage, and it will be kind of fun. But now they already have to think about a little bit, okay, what can we pick here? Now, don't get me wrong, there are still good heroes out there, you can still go for a proper composition, but first of all, it's cool to see not always the same hero every single map, so they have to deviate away from that. But there's also a few choices where they might be pushed out of their comfort zone again. Maybe someone has to play a hero that he's not that familiar with. And especially the tanks could become interesting now. We might see someone in a main tank position where he usually is not really set up there. Could be the case, but time will tell. Varian gets picked immediately. Alright, so Varian gets taken. Varian, of course, played also as a main tank right now, ever since he got buffed a little bit. Blizzard just came in and said, okay, we have to do something about that bad boy. He seems to be in a decent spot. He's just not strong enough right now. They buffed him. They increased the hit point pool. And now he can go for sniper combos with this. Normally, you would follow that up with the Malfurion or Stukov. But both of them have already been banned out. There's other supports that could still be played with him. But you're already losing a little bit on what you could do with him here. Now, Sonya gets taken too. Uh, so we got her. And we have Malganus again. You're getting a bit low on main tanks, and Stitches and May are also still up, but we've seen on the third map in our previous, in our first best of three, in the group stage, we've seen already Malganus on the last map, and the same is now true as well. But there's still going to be a bit of a choice on... What is Chris actually going to play now? And also, what is Blikitney going to take? For the two of them, that's really what I want to see. Uther and Malthael. All right. So Uther gets taken. That also picks it away from the opponent, which is also kind of important, because, again, Uther is one of the best heroes if you want to deny Varian value. That's not really a great cooldown trade for you if you have to drop a Divine Shield, but even Guardian of the Ancient Kings on level 7 is a really nice tool, so you have a couple of options with Uther of what you can do if you want to ruin these combos a little bit. But in this situation, it also offers you another stun, so you can actually follow up. And if you don't feel that you need to have the Divine Shield, which I still think they're going to take because they're going to drop it on Malthael, I suppose, then you could also go Divine Storm and just follow up with even more stun after Varian dropped the initial taunt on the target. But looking at this, Malthael with Tormented Souls plus a Divine Shield has been played a lot. Could be played here. We'll see. If you find, like, it depends a little bit on what else they're going to pick, because if he's going to be the one that rotates between lanes, then maybe not so much. But again, there are multiple options of them. 
for them now how they could play this one out. But let's focus first on what Team Mana is going to pick. They really surprised on map number two. They played great. I have to highlight it again. They're not playing with their final form. Camembert is subbing in today. And he had some great moves too. So definitely a good sub that they chose for today. For this group stage. Mena, as I mentioned, will be back for the main event. Lulnara! Alright, we got Bambi, everybody. Yeah, Lulnara is in. Bambi and Anduin. Okay, let's go. <laughs> I didn't really expect Lunara. There's way, there's so many DPS still out that he could take. Didn't think they would go for her. Now in the past, what we've seen is that Lunara kind of was used to, I want to say counter Uther a little bit to put more pressure onto him because it's just harder for him to deal with a lot of damage over time. And now we got the double support. Nice. Oriel gets played, and we have Vala. Yeah, this is also where they're starting to deviate a bit away from some of the standards. I like it! Double support! Varian, double support, Martha Ale, and Vala as the hyper damage dealer. I mean, Martha Ale can, of course, also pack a punch, but yeah, this is gonna be game number three. Azerite, what we're gonna got for him? It is Gul'dan! Alright, for the fell baby. Towers of Doom, game number three, everybody. Let's head straight into the final map of the best of three series and see which team advances to the winner's match to face off against Team Hazu. Let's go. Game number three, Team Main against Team Blick Kidney. Towers of Doom is the map and it is time to party. All right. Banana Age on Anduin, Sven on Sonya, we got Azarite on Lunara, Come on Bear on Mulganis, and Nano is playing Gul'dan for the blue team. He came back in on map number two, and now we're heading into our third and final map of this series with Chris on Vala, Blikitni on Oriel, the Will Q on Varian, we got Henning on Utha, and Tai on Malthael. Yeah, so as we're heading into this, also a uh, big shout out, by the way, to all of the people supporting me on Patreon. Guys, without you, a tournament like this would not be possible. So thank you very, very much for it. Also, of course, all the features like the Insta replays and other things wouldn't be possible. You help me to keep the coverage of Heroes of the Storm here alive, and it's very much appreciated. Everybody that would like to support the channel as well and help me to continue, you can always check out patreon.com slash Kaldor. And again, big, big thank you to all of the supporters there. Yeah, after our little brawl in the middle, as both of the teams were looking for some damage, we now have the solo laners immediately focusing towards the top lane. There's a bit of a trap down here. Hello, and oh my god. He just saved his ass. Come on, Bear, totally just saved Banana Age. If that doesn't work, that would have been a kill, pretty much guaranteed. Gul'dan also didn't go for the Echoed Corruption. Instead, we're seeing him full fell. Pursuit of Flame here. Okay, that's gonna be interesting for Waveclear in particular, and well, nets him a kill early on. Malthael is down. <laughs> I gotta say, these guys are doing well. They really surprised me a little bit in game number two. The coordination that they showed to zone out Zeratul to make sure that Blikitmi's Carrigan didn't get a lot done and always focus her down quickly was really impressive. So you can see the coordination coming together for them. And it is kind of neat. The early kill in the game doesn't really... I mean, again, it doesn't tell us anything about the game, the outcome itself just yet. But it shows that they are willing to be even more aggressive now. We got the slam build for Sonya, as we see so often. So let's have a bit of a look. Also on level 1, we got the Hammer of the Lightbringer. Yeah, it's hammer time, baby. Will Q, careful. And Gul'dan comes in with just fell, 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 fell. One flame after another. So you have 19 stacks for that already. He's going to complete that very quickly. Good wall stun. Nice whip. Well done. Straight into the wall. They get the stun, but they can't follow up on it yet. Okay. Yeah, play kidney. Look at our Polish Oriel over here. If you wield a whip like that, you definitely have some experience with it. Kinky. That man whips in the bedroom. All I'm saying here. Okay, so for now, mid lane, spent, taunt. Yep, the level four is in, and there's the kill. That's how you play this, right there. Nicely done. Good job. Okay, so for now, we have the quest completed also on Gul'dan, but once that the taunt was in, that's really where the kills start. And that's what we're gonna see from here on out, six days to Sunday, every single time. Try to come through with a taunt and then damage follow-ups. 
Anduin will have to uh, shut that down as much as he can with his trade and always be close. Try to make sure that the target is being saved a second later. Because it is gonna get tricky. <laughs> yeah, just as I praised him for his whip work, Nikita actually misses one. Unfortunate. They might get the kill, but no! Nano gets saved, Banana H with the Anduin plays. As much as, and as far as Anduin is concerned, I gotta say that he is honestly one of the best Anduins that we have. Shots fired on all sides, the easy exchange, top left, top right. And now in the middle, the third altar being fought over. Uh oh, he got shut down. Come on, Bear! There's no way to save him. No, 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 that's not happening. He goes down, and that's another altar for Team Blake Kidney. Okay, bottom of the map, they were trying to get even more done, but they couldn't. Slambled for Sonia, continues as usual. Chris, pretty noteworthy, I suppose, that he didn't go for his arrow build. We've seen that for him a lot, but he goes for a normal multi-shot build here. Level 7 talents are just a bit quicker. And finishes the multi-shot up for now. Obviously, on level 16, you're gonna go Manticore, and then Buff like Quiver on level 20. And for now, the touch of death. Plus the hand of protection. Alright, hand of protection is in. And Anduin is still playing this. Uh, Varian is still playing this out at the bottom here. It's kind of also interesting to see that Varian goes up against his his son. Yeah, so we're going to finally find out which one is stronger. I mean, honestly, if it comes to any kind of like hairstyling contest, I think Anduin is going to win that hands down. Varian not really known for his uh, sexy looks when it comes to hairstyle. But when it comes to actual team fight potential, then I think Varian is going to take the cake here. So Anduin, at this point, is going to learn from the master, I suppose. Varian finally in position where he can teach his son a lesson that he's trying to immediately. Yeah, Torn is already out. They're trying to go for the kill, but in comes Sonya with a slam, slam, slam. And it's the end of Oriel. Oriel is dead and Henning is... Probably gonna die, maybe gonna die. Does he have a heal? Cool down? Yes, there we go. Alright, keeping him alive. But holy hell. <laughs> Splintered Spear on level 7. And we're waiting for uh, the heroics. Also, we got the Battle Rage in. Yep. Bit more damage to mercenaries, which is kind of neat now for Sonya because she's gonna be in a situation where he can very, very easily take all of the pumpkin camps, especially the one up at the top. Slight experience lead, but two kills to two. I like it. It's gonna be a nice game between the two now. Lunara, of course, coming in with the damage the entire time, poking them out slowly. Hobbity hop as Azerite is hopping around, applying one stack after another. Yeah, they're trying for Ty, and Ty is in a shit ton of trouble now. He's down. He's dead. He's slowed. That's the end of him. There's the first channel. Blue team gets one. Go for the exchange, and that's now 28 points to 32 in favor of Team Blickenday. Yeah, we have a fun one on our hands. This is just blow for blow the entire time, and now both of the teams are closing in on level 10. Also, we got the Black Claws in too. A bit more damage on him as well. There's Gul'dan with a Horrify. And we have the Carrion Swarm in. Obviously the Wrath of the Berserker, I mean, what else are you gonna go for with Sonya? So that's what you gotta do. Aegis is in. Last rites. And we're still waiting for Uther. Uther is honestly be the, is gonna be the biggest question mark. I, and I guess I suppose it's gonna be Lunara's choice as well. I would... I had... Actually, thinking about it... I mean, initially I expected her to go for Leaf. Gives her a little bit more mobility in these situations, and he goes for it. Thornwood Vines would be kind of nice if you feel that you're safe enough, but I don't think she is. If you have a distant poke against Bell Towers, for example, you could maybe even uh, get those and control them. There's also now the Divine Shield, so they're really, really trying to save those times. I mean, oh boy, there's no additional stun. They got Aegis and Divine Shield, both of them now. Anduin has not made a choice yet. I mean,. No, he actually goes for the word, all right. He goes for the bubble. Bubble is out. There's a jump. Vala is down. That's the main damage dealer. That's the hyper carry. And now they're on the run. They're on the run. Blake Hitney, the mad heals that are coming from the two supports here. They're keeping everyone alive, but they could not save the hyper carry. It was way too fast. I mean, they were all locked down too. Now they get the uh, pumpkins coordinated into the bell tower, and the altar is spawning. They're still trying to burn this down a little bit. So much work done here by Team Mena. They are impressing me. They're really impressing me in this series so far. It's going to be 28 points to 28. 
And up towards the top, come on, Bear. Still doing his thing. <laughs> the mad sustain, by the way, that we just saw for Team the Kidney. And also, really good isolation on Vala, because you have Aegis, you have Divine Shield, if any of that gets dropped, Vala survives, and that's what that's, that's the main reason why like, Chris was actually playing it out like this. Here comes the attack, Aegis already used, okay, coordination is there as well, Divine Shield is still available for them, one versus one up at the top, and uh, that's a kill. Hello, Ty, Ty, oh, he might miss it now, juked, baby, yeah, he lost it, and he knew it too. But again, he forces him back. That could have been a kill though, that got close. That got very close. Alright, sleeper setup. Jumped in, except they're trying to turn it now against Chris. Chris is getting just crushed by this. They need to have everything on him. Horrify to save Malganis and get a bit of damage in too. Nice setup honestly for Vala because they, they all lined up for the multi shot. Where's Chris actually sitting on the damage output? 25,000, oh my god, look at Gul'dan. 40,000 damage on Gul'dan. <laughs> the boy is dropping the numbers here. Jesus. He is absolutely dropping the numbers right now. That is kind of insane. <laughs> okay, double alt is up. And, well, let's go. For now, we got on level 13 the synergy with the level 1. He goes for the fell armor. 13 talents available for both teams, which gives us the inevitable end. Unstoppable frames for our boy, for Malthael. Yeah, and now it, it's, this should be an easy exchange. I mean, again, this is uh, this is just going to be one versus one over here. Yep, nothing else. There we go. Abolish magic is in. Okay, down here. Ooh, they try to invade. They don't have Sonya here. Sven is coming in. Kamamea is coming in. They might... Ah, the whip. Completing the quest. Nice. That whip was worth a lot. If they don't get it, then they're in trouble. They're in trouble anyways. The kidney gets the divine shield. They had to drop both ults to keep Aureal alive. Both ults. And Chris is low. Chris is low and he was split from the supports too. There's the horrify. The bubble from Anduin. And they are still not getting the kills. Damn. Everybody is so low on the blue team, on the red team side. But that is what a double support is going to do for you. It's so difficult to drop anybody here. They baited out a ton of cooldowns. But they can't get the kill yet. But they are dropping damage. Gul'dan in particular. He kills Ariel. That is the end of Uther. And Lunara in the back line. She gets the kill against Vala. She drops down too. But hash worth it four kills to one big trade big trade and a bell tower check this one out oh boy yeah that fight was all over the place here yeah, nicely done four kills lunara sacrificing herself sven is now moving to the top and they are coming in for a kill against the second bell tower I am so impressed by this team even with the sub player they're doing so well here 52,000 damage for Gul'dan, top keep or top bell tower, super low, but Sven might have overstayed. He might have stayed a little bit too long. Uh, hello? Taunt? What? Oh, no way. Now they can't even get the kill here. Triple altar phase. Things are really falling apart for Blink Hidden's team. They were trying to get the taunt in, but he just couldn't get close enough to drop it. And now we are looking at a fantastic setup here. That's a double channel very likely, and that's going to be 10 points of the red team's core if they succeed with it. But they're getting invaded. They're getting invaded hard. Chris needs to be interrupted. I just don't know if anybody can get close enough to do it. Yeah, well, Anduin can, but they need more. And that's where Malganus comes into play. So yeah, they're fighting for it, and they're going to get it. Red team is falling back. They don't want to face this. Level 16 talents are against them. There's no way they're going to take that fight. Just not happening. And Gul'dan is now the rampant hellfire. Another 5 shots get fired and it's 14 points to 21. Now this is the biggest comeback map in the entire map pool. Obviously uh, this is not over. But I think it's even with the double support going to be really different, uh, difficult for Team the Kidney. Riz is trying to poke this one out. Especially retaking a structure is so difficult since they only have one hero that can properly poke. It's only Chris. Who else is doing serious damage from a distance? There's nobody in there. So Topside gets pressured by uh, by Sonya. She takes the camps. There's a 16 finally. Maybe the Manticore can switch it up. But they're locking down. Come on, Bear. Manticore, the Horrify. 
the horrify Gul'dan uses it very defensively right now just to save the tank one of the pumpkins made it through and puts another damage point onto the core 21 to 13 level 16 it's ready and here well this one is going to make it through that's another bell tower isn't it yep seven uh, sorry six to two six to two bell towers oh boy and have fun retaking control of those benediction is in they are trying they are trying they're coming down at the mo at the bot lane now but again where's the poke where's the damage where's the structural damage that helps you to retake the bell towers they are they're getting put into a corner they're getting pummeled here team mana with a big damage setups they're trying Sonia, she's coming back too. Single alt at the bottom of the map. Would put them into single digits. If they take it, it's single digits here. A to three. And that's it. Yeah, they're gonna drop down to seven points on the core and the boss is still up. The red team rotates topside to retake at least one of the bell towers, but bot lane control is completely lost to them. And bot lane control, because of all the pumpkins, is obviously the most important one. So retake at the top is happening. That's a start. It's a start for you. But what else can they do here? Sonia is moving in again. Starting to do her thing. Down at the bottom of the map. Yep, there's Camo Bear right now. Banana H is also in position for it. All of them just shielding this. Sonia can still move in between the mid and the top if she wants to. But she doesn't have to. They're already so heavily ahead in experience. It's not even needed. They're pushing the mid lane as well. And they try to turn it on Sven, but honestly, that's too deep. That doesn't allow Chris to really bridge the gap and dish the damage out safely. And that's what he needs to do. If he gets 20, that's a different story. Then he has, of course, his Farfly Quiver. But right now, it's a, it's a problem. Sonia is trying to take another camp. Will Q is already low. That damage output from Gul'dan in particular is just nuts at this point. He is just dropping that damage over and over again in these team fights. And he's always hitting multiple targets also with these waves. Yeah, it's kind of bonkers. And the other support is just sitting there trying to keep up with all of that. Eight kills to three now. Another pumpkin camp through the bottom. And let's be honest, if, if those pumpkins connect, even if only two connect, another altar channel is going to end the game. So they need, they need to take it down. Well, they're doing their best here. They dropped them, all of them. Sonya in the meantime is attempting to get them level 20. Last ride, it's just not enough. Oh, but that whip, that's a different story. Great play by Blakidney. That one was perfect, and it comes at such an important moment in the game. Now they can move in and take that altar. If they would have lost that one, it's, I guess, lights out, but no. Now they have a 5 versus 4, and there's no level 20 net. That's the moment. That's the moment right here. And they take it. It's only three shots fired. Again, it's not gonna give them a mad lead or anything. 18 to 7. But they're invading. They're diving. They're going for it. There's only three of them. Five versus three. They're going deep for the kill. They want it. The horrified. Do not tell me they get out. No freaking way. Really? They dove the bell tower with everything they had and they couldn't get a kill. But at least they're retaking the bell tower. But Utha dies. No! No! They don't even retake the bell tower! What? Oh, and Sonia at the top is murdering the next one. Oh my god, that's bad news. 20 is ready. That gives us the intensifying toxin. Ignore pain. Malthael gets soloed by Sonia. What the hell? Oh my god. What is happening? Team Mene, they lost game number one and now they are just bringing the pain here. They go for the boss, they burn it easily. Top bell tower has been claimed, they're dropping them down to three points. Wow. Yep, 20 versus 20, but they are down to only three points on the core and it's a double altar that spawns. Farfly Quiver is finally ready, Diamond Resolve. Glory to the Alliance. I didn't know what this shit does. Alright. And <laughs> look at this. Bulwark of Light. They upgrade everything that can keep them alive somehow. Everything that they went for here. They have to face the music on the left side. They know it too. They come in and they go for the team fight.
And Gul'dan is dropping damage, damage, and damage. He's pretty much doubling the damage output that we're seeing from uh, from Vala. And they go for the kill, the horrify, and the win is... Oh my god, Varian kills... Varian just got killed by his son. Varian just got killed by Anduin. Anduin killed his father. Seriously? Oh my god, what is this, Game of Thrones? It's like, Jesus, dude, calm down. That's a little bit harsh, all that hate here. Talking about hate, they're going for a Blink Kidney too, guys. This is a five-man wipe. Five-man team wipe, and Team Ada comes into the winner's match. Unbelievable. Easy double hits, nicely done. They get two wins in a row, and they decide Game 3 in their favor. Team Ada with a 2-1 victory against Team Blink Kidney in Meta Madness.